thank you all for taking time to attend uh, my presentation today. Uh, just to clarify, my background is in computer science, however, purely in hardware. Uh, I view myself as a facilitator of uh, execution of applications. My understanding of machine learning is that, oh, this is what people do, let me see what I can do for them. Uh, I have very undemandary understanding of what machine learning is, why it works, and all this kind of stuff. So I really appreciate your time today, and more so because I understand you have so much attention from everywhere and everywhere. Uh, so hardware is uh, a bit of, uh, I think, an afterthought for most people, especially in the academic domain, because we don't actually, as of today, we don't yet build this kind of machines. It's more about what we could build. So I'm also quite privileged to have worked with several exceptional people over the years. Uh, the names you see up here are people that uh, were either in my group before or are currently in my group, and they have uh, really contributed to the work I'm presenting. Some of the work initially was done with uh, Tyler Heatherton, who uh, was a student at the UBC. And Tor Amor is a faculty member there. Natalie Enright Zeger is also a faculty here at, at U of T. Uh, that is about earlier work in there. Uh, a bit of background for, for myself. So uh, sorry if I, I will start sounding like an old person. It happens quite a bit later for me. I don't know why. But I started wo uh, getting interested in computers back in the early 80s. Right? At the time, I was in Europe, in Greece in particular. And the hot machine at the time was something called ZX Spectrum. It was a very nice machine. The nice thing it had, it was uh, s uh, once you plugged into your TV, it would give you a prompt. And that was already a basic programming environment. That is, even to load a game, which, by the way, you did with a cassette uh, through modem sounds, you had to understand that you have to write a command and a string, whatever. But if you want to draw something on the screen, it was very easy. So I was, immediately I was drawn to programming. Somehow it clicked for me and everything at that level, right? I remember I was in high school now, seemed reasonable. And I was lucky that a friend of mine, he, he, the parents bought this for him. And because he wasn't doing particularly well in school, they gave it to me. So I can, I can, I can play with it. So for whatever reason, the time thought software is cool. But you know what's cooler? I mean, uh, okay, anybody can write software. Right? This is, again, like a 13-year-old, 14-year-old talking, right? What is cooler is actually building one of these. That was the Z80 at the time. And by the way, I was also lucky because this was a time where you could, if you wanted to build something like that on your own, I'm not saying same quality, you could actually build a computer. You can take the components, plug it in, do wire wrapping, whatever. And I had the pleasure to doing that as an undergrad too. You could do that. I wouldn't, yeah. A university could actually build complete operating system, hardware, applications, and, and beat industry. Exactly. And yeah, not, not everybody in academia, but specific people, right? Uh, absolutely. So I thought that the ultimate achievement in life, if you care about computers, was actually building hardware, right? That's my thought over there. Now, I'm not uh, 13 or 14 anymore, obviously. I know I look OK. But anyway, uh, long story short, at some point, I kind of realized that hardware essentially is just building tools. Right? That's, that's what we do. If you build a computer, wonderful. So you have a computer. It looks at you, you look at it, nothing happens. So what really, the magic, the actual real, real innovation is in the software, right? What you do with it. And it is true that, at least from the, from, the, from the hardware perspective, that the stuff that people do in the hardware facilitates a, a breadth of applications that basically touches every aspect of modern life. Right? So I find some solace in that, that even though I chose to build hardware, I am still, to some degree, useful through several levels of indirection to actual practical things. But it's not lost in my mind that you know, I think the universe will survive even if we don't build more hardware. So people will do some stuff. It's really about uh, uh, facilitating software. So uh, past decades, I started really studying and working in hardware in the mid-90s. It was about, always it was about building the best uh, computing uh, hardware engine. And if you look at the decades past, I would say 2005 backwards, you had this picture if you were a hardware person. And this is how, in my view, a very abstract view, how computing worked. You had people that do applications, and people that always do applications want to put more features. They're trying to find more stuff to do. So for, to in order to support the more stuff, you needed better hardware. But somehow, the semiconductor industry was able to give you that performance, that additional computing power. More so, people like uh, that do architecture were able to harness these additional resources to provide this additional performance, P people were actually building better applications, okay, better hardware, so on and so forth. So it was a nice uh, uh, feedback loop. And every two years, you'll get 2x, okay? 
Now, another thing that was happening in the decades past is that computer science has really hit the mark and managed to isolate, so everybody could innovate pretty much in isolation. And that was primarily about interfaces. At the hardware level interfaces, your instruction set, open system might be the open system calls, whatever, there are multiple levels of abstraction. So everybody pretty much were doing the, their thing. You could do databases without necessarily knowing about hardware, and I could do hardware without necessarily understanding databases, right? And that was fine. Because again, every two years you could get two X. So when that was the case, the game from my perspective was to build the best general purpose processor. That is, I will try to find various applications out there. There are actually uh, benchmarking suites, so you can take that. I will study them and try to find what can I do for these applications that will give me this 2x in two years or whatever. And there's a lot of innovations that have happened. And if you look at the most successful stuff, they're really uh, not application specific. They kind of work for pretty much everything. And the important thing to realize is that most of them work because they understand that problems are not random objects, right? They're like all people or people that have uh, particularities. I woke up in the morning, I need to drink coffee. Others in my household don't need to do that. But so for example, I, I hope that a lot of you are familiar with caches, which are fast memories on the chip. The reason these things work is because programs have something that uh, called locality. They tend to access the same thing close in time. You can write a program that doesn't have locality. You can write a program, you can prove caches are useless, but the sole purpose of that program is just to prove that point. No real program I'm aware of actually does that intentionally, right? The problems do happen to have these properties. So most of our work was trying to understand what behaviors exist in applications. How can I build hardware techniques that will give you performance just because that happens? If uh, back in the day, back in the days like 10, 10, 15 years ago, you went and said, I'm gonna build you a specialized engine for, for something, people will laugh with your face and say, get out of here, I'm not interested. Why? Because two years down the line, I'm having a machine to, that's 2X, applications evolve, your hardware will probably be useless, worst case scenario. If anything, it will be only a delta over general purpose hardware and the market is gonna be very small. Who cares about you? Nobody does that. So specialization was very restricted to extreme cases where there was a clear market case and a clear need like video encoding. And even then it wasn't absolutely necessary. So nobody will talk about that. Now, this is a marketing slide from Intel. I haven't drawn these graphics. I don't necessarily condone the style of the graphics or whatever, but I put it up there to make a point. This is from uh, two, three years back. I would like you to focus on this. This is the marketing slide that Intel had that will try to convince you why you should buy a new processor from them. And let's uh, blow up this up. And it says the following. And you have to look at, first of all, kudos to them that they're actually truthful, right? They're not trying to trick you or anything like that. Keyword, up to. Okay, what is up to? I guarantee you, you will not exceed that. That's what up to, right? That's, that's what it means. And it says 28% better performance, which means like one third. And versus another three, three year old desktop. Remember before, it was two X every two years. Now it's 30% every three years. So long story short, there is a, something is different, right? And this is like the cream of the crop in the industry, right? This is Intel. So if you do the math or whatever, this means that over a decade, whereas before you could have a machine that would be 32 times faster than the one that you could build in the beginning of the decade, you're not gonna have that. So it's a major issue because it impacts innovation in all other fields in computing. You cannot just assume that your machines are gonna be faster, whatever. So why is this happening? Uh, maybe you've heard this before. So I'll summarize it briefly what has to do, what's the fundamental reason behind it. Again, this is a bit, lower level in the stack than my expertise is, but it has to do with semiconductors. So it used to be in the past that every two years you'll be able for the same, this is supposed to be a, pic, a, a picture of an actual processor chip. It doesn't matter what processor it is, but it's just, uh, it's meant to illustrate a point. In the past, if you waited two years, the people that do the semiconductor physics and the processes, that is they're building the actual chips, could give you for the same area roughly enough resources to get this 2X. So there will be more transistors, more switches, more wires you can, and that will run faster as well. And you can try to build a machine, use all these resources to try to build a machine that's faster. Uh, however, anytime you use a transistor or a wire, because there's charges that change, uh, there is heat that has been dissipated, and that has to go away. Right? Uh, and it's not easy to take it away because these things are tiny. So what happened for the, in, the 20s, uh, in the past decade, people could build uh, 
uh, uh, faster machines, and they try to do that for various reasons, which I want to go to, to that, by building more cores. So whereas before you could buy one processor per die, now you can have four processors per die. Next generation, you have more transistors, maybe you can build eight processors per die. I think right now com commodity parts are at the eight range, so you can get high-end parts that have 32 or 64. However, what was common in every single case, every new generation, you could use all the resources at the same time. Now, because uh, again, there's the issue of uh, you switching things and this generates heat, you need to dissipate that heat and people cannot do that anymore. So long story short, as far as people are concerned, you could still get more resources per generation. So two years down the line, hopefully you will be able to build a process that has more transistors, more wires. However, there is another catch. You will not be able to use all of it. So this example is supposed to illustrate that you can use half of it at any given point in time. So there is an obvious observation you will be able to make. If I can use half of it, what is the point of building four cores in such an example, having four identical processors? Because I can use it like that. There are two that are active. I cannot use because my thermal limits are hit. I could do this. I could use the two on the side, but it's still two, and they're identical. So practically speaking, from a user perspective, this is exactly the same machine. Who cares whether it's the two bottom or the two on the side? I could do this. It's the two bottom, but again, it's, you still have two processors. So for whatever is, for the reasons I explained, what's going to happen moving forward, it's happening already. You're going to have more transistors, you're going to have more resources, but if you try to just replicate and do more of the same, more cores, it's not going to fly anymore because you're not going to be used all of them at the same time. It makes no sense to build homogeneous systems. That is systems where you have multiple copies of the same thing. So all there is in computer hardware now is specialization, exact opposite than before. Why? because it makes no sense to build the chip I described before. It makes sense to build things like that. Because at any given point of time, you will be able to turn on the parts that you care about. For example, here I have turned on these four different pieces. This could be a general purpose core. This could be a core, for example, that does graphics well. This could be a core that does, I don't know, audio very well. This could be a core that does machine learning very well. Right. And very well means that if you specialize, the expected uh, gains are typically in the order of uh, a few orders of magnitude. 10x, 100x, 1500x. This is, uh, these are common things that you expect when you specialize. And uh, we can offline explain why this is the case. So long story short, the way that we view the world in, uh, of computing from a hardware perspective right now in terms of the whole ecosystem is a bit different. You're going to have people that do particular applications. And the ones that I, I'm really interested in is machine learning at this point. Uh, and at the other side, you're going to have people trying to specialize hardware and try to see what is the best mix of uh, system software and hardware that will better serve these applications so that you can have these advances in innovation in machine learning. Uh, algorithmically, I expect that even in machine learning, even though there are going to be advances that try to reduce computation, most of the stuff will come if you have more powerful machines, machines that can do more per unit of time. So this is where my interest lies, on this part. And so far, because of our background, most of our innovations are here. So what I'm going to be talking today about, so this was the first part of, uh, of the talk, what I'm going to be talking about is some overview of some of the stuff we've done. Just to give you a, a sense of uh, how we can be useful to you, because that's the, that's the point here. Right? Uh, we will try to come up with machines that can allow you to do more at the machine learning level by providing you more capability per unit of time. Uh, we can do, for example, things like there's commodity hardware, a GPU, or there's X architecture you're using. We can try to help you to better map your application to that particular hardware to do what you need. So this is one aspect we can help as, uh, with our expertise. The real love, however, from our side is the second part, which is we can try to build custom hardware for your application. Now, build, put it in quotes. That is, we can try to develop techniques that if you could build the custom hardware, it can help you. And I will comment that on in a second. And f the third aspect is we can try to help you by co-design the application and the hardware. Again, this would be about optimizations. I'll give you some examples that maybe uh, are a bit more close to home for you that I am aware of. Maybe there are tons of others. Quantization which is something you have to do if you want to get practical performance on specific devices. Sparsity, where you trim things. Again, you don't do this because you need to. You do this because you want to get a particular level of performance on actual hardware. Otherwise, you wouldn't care about that, right? 
or conditional execution, trimming things, which is another form of this, depending on the input, or data encoding communication, how do you store through memory, how do you send things across machines and things like that. These are the things that we're, we can help with. Finally, it used to be the case that to build hardware, you had to be a big company with a lot of money. It was only in the mid-80s that academia could actually build machines, as you said, that could beat uh, industry. Nowadays, the, and I mean, for 90s and early 2000s, that was not the case. However, today, exactly because there is a need for specialization, there is room to build specialized engines. There is an ecosystem right now. Uh, when I came in 2000, the, the only company in town that was doing hardware was a big company was actually ATI. It was building uh, uh, cars. Now it's called AMD because AT, AMD bought them. But right now, there's uh, tons of companies in, and in particular in the GTA area, that are big internationals that have the capability of being specialized hardware. Furthermore, exactly because uh, custom hardware is so expensive to build and it doesn't scale as it used to, uh, reconfigurable hardware, which is a form of how you can program on the fly, is competitive for certain cases. So we can help with that right, as well. So if you have a particular need for something, we can try to build a reconfigurable prototype that you can use, or we can try to link up with some of the industry to see if whether they're willing to build it too. So with this in mind, uh, back in 2013, <coughs> uh, uh, myself and several colleagues made the decision that in order for, from the hardware perspective to be relevant moving forward, we got to reach out. And this is uh, something I've been trying to do for several years. In order for us to be able to do something useful, we have to reach out to people that do applications, understand what they need, and then try to build uh, machines. So you have to create an environment where people, be it from applications, systems, software, or hardware, have a way of interacting and find out what's the best computer system we can, we can build right now. In the past, this was nice. Today, in my opinion, this is essential. So as part of that effort, uh, back in 2014, we applied to NSERC to create a research network whose purpose was to develop hardware acceleration techniques for machine learning. The network is called Cohesa because this was before the whole explosion happened in interesting machine learning. But if you look at the actual participants, the, the, it's, the focus is on machine learning. This is a 19 PI network. Uh, and uh, I'm, I were also very grateful that some of them are actually very, very, I mean, one of the top minds in machine learning. Uh, uh, this includes from Vector, Raquel Oterson, and Sanya Findler, and also Yoso Benzio and uh, Chris Paul from uh, uh, Montreal. Now, it would have been nice if there were tens of others. I am actually very grateful that they are finding time and they're talking to us because I do understand you have so much attention that you don't need to do that. Uh, on top of that, the bulk of this network is uh, research-wise are hardware people. Hardware people like myself, which is about application techniques, reconfigurable hardware, or even physical devices like interfaces and transistor stuff. And that we do have a lot of industrial partners. These are uh, large companies that do have the capability of doing like this. The network has been operating for about a year. We just went almost finished, almost finished the first year review. I think you have a similar experience here. And I think we're going to be OK. So there is a bulk, uh, there's some critical mass over here. And my hope is that this is going to be a skeleton upon which other collaborations will grow uh, from it. Now. Enough with the introductory stuff. This was very short, I'm sure. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the stuff we're doing. So most of our work so far targets uh, neural networks. And in particular, we target primarily things that are uh, convolutional neural networks and th things that are heavily on the convolution side, but they do apply on others as well. Um, you can check whether I have some understanding of it. So that's why this slide is up there. So I have some images, for example, let's do, do images first. And I have a bunch of layers, and I get some indication of what the image depicts. So, and you know the computation. I'm going to be showing you diagrams like this. There is, this is the image coming in or the input to a layer. It's a volume that's 3D. These are the runtime values. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be talking primarily about inference today, not uh, training. But uh, we, do, we have some stuff for training too, and we're very interested in that as well. I have the knowledge of the network through so various uh, filters, and as you know, you do convolutions, you apply that, you get the output activation, so on and so forth, okay? Now, and you can, you repeat for different positions and that's the end of it. Now, from a hardware perspective, if you look at what the computation is, it's basically a deeply nested loop. Six loop, uh, six nested, seven nested, something like that if you do convolutions. At the end, what it boils down to is this. You have to do a lot of multiplications of runtime values, inputs, the ways that you know, and you accumulate, you pass through some activation function and you get your output. 
So from a hardware perspective, this is a very simple computation. It has a very nice property. This is massively parallel. Uh, this, this supposed, you take these loops, interchange them, chop them, do whatever you want. At the end, it will calculate roughly the same modular computer arithmetic. It will calculate the same result. This is wonderful from a hardware perspective because lots of parallelism means I have a lot of opportunities for doing, uh, changing the order, doing things like that. So if you know that most of your life is going to be about multiply, accumulate, this is what I want to do. Right? There's very interesting machines you can build. So, and this is not about our work. I'm just telling you what we thought people are going to build. So here we are. This is about four years ago. And we're saying, if I know that my computation is going to be this kind of thing, what will industry build next? Why we're doing this experiment? Because we want to be relevant, right? I don't want to compete with industry. I would like to think once industry does what is the first thing I would normally have done if I was working for them, what would be the next step? So my point here is to illustrate that there's stuff you can do beyond that. So if you know that your calculation is going to be take this volume, take this volume, multiply, accumulate, and find the output, what you're going to do is something like this. Rather than having a programmable engine, you're going to say, take the one input, take the other input. What am I doing? Multiply, accumulate. Well, put a lot of multipliers, as many as you can afford in hardware. Multiply in parallel, as opposed to one after the other. You got a lot of sums, you know reduction, it's very easy to do with a reduction tree and accumulate on the output. Yeah. So, so affording the, the multipliers is not expensive, but maybe the memory bandwidth to feed them is expensive? As well. Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be stuff I'm going to talk about specifically about that. But it's interesting some, sometimes where instead of focusing on this first, when you focus on that stuff, it actually backpropagates and you find things on that it can help over here. So that's kind of telling about how innovation should be pursued in the, an academic environment as opposed to industry. Remember, industry, you're fighting for your life. You have to come up with a product in a year or two that has to work. And it has to attack the first order problems. Academia, you have to think, industry is doing that. How can I be relevant to them? What is the crazy things that we should try just in case these are going to be useful? So we started from the computation side as opposed to memory because we felt that people are going to attack this first, the memory side. And I'm, I'm going to explain, hopefully, a little bit more about that. So I built this kind of thing. This is extremely specialized. You just do multiplications, uh, reductions, and that's the end of it. And then notice that I have multiple filters. So each filter uses the same input from here. So I have this is going to be reused across. So I'm going to build, build a lot of those, in, uh, as many as I can afford, multiple units. Keep putting as many as you want you end up with a structure that looks like this. And notice, now in terms of memory bandwidth, this stuff is actually the same all the time. So it's not important to explain why this is the case or whatever, but roughly you end up with a structure that looks like this. There are the inputs that are being reused across multiple multi uh, multipliers. These are the weights that are coming in, a lot of other trees. And this is the baseline processing element. And then you can build a large array of uh, this kind of stuff. And a very interesting question, once you have an array like this, is how do you block your computation so you move data as least as possible? And that was the thing that we were certain people are going to work on. It's a very interesting problem, but here's this. It's a problem that is not unique to machine learning. This applies to any kind of linear algebra computation. These are really mostly matrix multiplication. It's a problem that people have been working since, I don't know, you tell me, 50s, 60s. There's a lot of work over there. Yes, there is interesting work to be done over there. But I was certain that people are going to attack that first. So that's why we didn't go to that, because we felt there's a lot of work to build upon. And maybe the interesting stuff, from our perspective, would be here. Okay. So we started with this. Now, here is now I'm wearing my computer architect cap, which had to do, it's from my roots from general computing. The idea here in general computing is the following. You're telling me you're, you have to do this computation. So the user writes a program and says, in this case, I want you to compute this. And notice what I say up there, do as you're told. Sometimes in life that's good, sometimes it's not. Same for hardware. So the users told you, you have to do this multiply accumulates. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, fine. But now let me look at what I really have to do. Because ultimately, what you care about is that at the end, out has the right value. If I can find something else to do that will give you exactly the same value, you wouldn't care. Actually, you're going to appreciate it because I'm going to speed up your computation without even trying. So. We look at this uh, computation and we say, beyond the structure, which I just showed you, these multipliers and the other trees, and beyond the data reuse, the blocking you're going to do to minimize your data traffic, whatever, what properties can I find in your computation so I can on the fly, without you knowing necessarily, the way to say that is, without you requiring to do anything, can I give you more performance? 
So I want to exploit application behavior. I want to approach these computations, convolutions, whatever they are, as people with particularities. Can I find any behaviors similar to locality for general purpose programs that will allow me to reduce computation? And I do not want to sacrifice accuracy. I want you to give an exact result as before. Furthermore, I do not want to require you to do development just for me so that you map on the particular hardware. Right? If you read, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you have read the uh, Alex Rivevsky paper, the AlexNet. He had to split the computation into two parts so that it will fit on two GPUs. Yes, it's not, I mean, anybody can do that, yes, but I mean, I can mop the floor too. Do you want a person like him spending time to do that kind of mapping, or you want them to focus on how, what's the best network, what is the best method to do back propagation, what is the arrangement of layers? I think that's where your expertise is in, and that's where most of your time should be spent, as opposed to trying to now squeeze the computation to particular hardware you have. So that's why we're starting with this. However, at the same time, I want to reward you if you're willing to do some optimizations, like pruning or precision reduction or not. So I will walk you through the stuff we tried to exploit over the years. First thing we did, we noticed, like many others have noticed at the time, when you do uh, convolutions, and particularly when you work with ReLU, a lot of the computations end up uh, producing a zero activation, right? The, the runtime calculator. And you know, anytime you multiply something to zero, you get a zero, then you accumulate it to the output, you get a zero. This is useless. You cannot identify it statically, however, because this is runtime behavior. So we build a machine that is massively data parallel. That was the difficult part that will skip those. Skip, I don't mean shut down. I mean, it will advance other useful computation. Remember, you told me I'm going to do thousands upon thousands of multiply accumulates where the data parallel engine that will do that for you. Furthermore, another thing that we notice is that there's a lot of values that are near zero that you also treat as zero. Right? It's basically noise. And we had a methodology, it was a software methodology to find the right thresholds per layer where we can trim this kind of thing. This was the first thing, and this is like three years back now. Uh, next thing we notice is the following. You know, back in the day, computers were 8-bit. Then they became 16-bit. Then they became 32-bit. I have no idea what is there. I mean, they call them 64-bit, but they have various data types. Long story short, when you build hardware, you build uh, multipliers, accumulators, for the widest data type you can based on the constraints you have. And then you say to the programmers, use that. And programmers say, OK, you give me 32 bits, I'll use 32 bits. You give me 16 bits, I'll use 16 bits. All there is now for many machine learning applications for cross-custom hardware is 8 bits. There's nothing special about 8. It's just a number that's convenient from a hardware perspective. If you look at what the application really needs, they have specific precision requirements. And you can do profiling. For example, you can find for layer X, you can do something with 3 bits. For layer Y, you can do with 5 bits, so on and so forth. So the next class of machines we built was machines whose performance we scale according to precision you wanted. If your baseline precision was 16 bits and your particular layer will work with 5 bits, my speed up will be 16 over 5. If you needed 9 bits, it would be 16 over 9. Again, if you didn't have to change your network, we can do profiling. However, if you were willing now to re uh, retrain your network to reduce precisions, we'll give you perf uh, proportional performance if you're willing to spend the time. If you're not willing, we'll just give you whatever the network can inherently do. So this is an example of a machine where you can spend time, if you wish, as a programmer to squeeze more performance out. However, depending on the network, it will give you something anyhow, because networks do require different precisions. If you do binary, it will still give you performance 16 over 1, 16 times faster. But it's not going to be as efficient as binary hardware. Final thing. Now, I want you to go back to, oh, sorry. No, it's not final thing. Uh, no, final, next thing. I'll get it. OK, I'm done. Wonderful. Next thing is the following. Go back to primary school. I'm doing that with my, uh, my daughter right now. And do multiplication. You take one number, you take the other number, and you take one digit from here, multiply, write it down. Second digit, multiply, write it down. Guess what? These are binary numbers. The digit you're getting from the second one is going to be 0 and 1. So when I'm multiplying a weight with an activation, it's only the bits that I want that really do something that's effectual, adding to the sum. And the interesting part is, if you look at the activations of typical networks that people use, more than 90% of the bits that are there are zeros, which means more than 90% of the work you do, if you break it down to really fundamental multiplication, primary school style, is useless. It's stuff I can throw out for you. So the next class of machines takes advantage of that. On the fly, it skips computations basic, <coughs> basically on zeros. Right? Another thing that we found is the following. 
you do for one window a multiplication of this activation, it has only this uh, bit that are one, with a particular weight. Later on, you slide your window, you do a multiplication with another activation, but this is very close. Notice this is the only difference in one bit here. So we have another enzyme that takes advantage of that, it works on deltas. This is particularly useful for what is all there is right now in computational imaging, where people, instead of doing analytical methods for do low-level computational imaging algorithms, they just throw convolutional neural networks at that. You want to do the mosaicing, you want to do the demo uh, noising, they just throw tons of convolutional neural networks on them. This works particularly well for, for this kind of stuff, and also opens up opportunities for training because uh, it allows you to work on deltas, which I suppose will happen quite often. Uh, you have very small deltas at, at, uh, during training. So, this is a historical figure right now. This is 2013-14. We started with zero skipping. This is our latest and greatest thing. Uh, most of this stuff is published, not all of it. Uh, all of it is on archive. Laconic is a machine that takes advantage of zero bits for both the activations and weight side. The numbers you see there are indicative. What kind of uh, performance I'm going to give you versus a very well optimized accelerator. On the bottom line, that's completely value unaware. That is, value agnostic, that if whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. I will take advantage of reuse, I will try to reduce communication, whatever. On top of that, this is what we give you. And if we have a bit of, a few moments, I'll give, I'll work you through some examples and I'll talk about a little bit about memory to see what kind of stuff you can do. Uh, again, remember, somebody told you to do this. And you say, let me do this calculation. And they say, you should do it with 16 bits. You should do it with 8 bits. What we do at the hardware level, we say, wait a moment. You told me I should do this like that. But let me look at the values you're actually calculating. Notice here I have an example where I, I expand the activations into the binary form. When I need to do these calculations, it's only the range of values that have that started with the one most significant bit that's 1 and the least significant bit that is 1. In this contrived example over here, you see that I only need four bits to process. So we have an engine whose performance scales proportionally to the number of bits that you need. The less bits you need, the faster it's going to be. And it's guaranteed to be always as good as the baseline. So again, I, I promise you I'm not going to go into the actual hardware. I'm just going to give you a sense of what is, uh, the hardware can provide. We do not require you to do anything with precision. You give me a 16-bit network, I will work on it. Yes, please. Are you saving space, or are you trying to get the, the, the number of I'm saving time, and I will, uh, that is, I'm doing things faster. I'm doing more computations per unit of time, okay, because uh, uh, we have to go into the actual hardware, but what is the baseline machine that will have to process all 16 bits will do, uh, say, 16 amount of work over 16 cycles. If I can only use one bit per computation, I will do 16 of them equivalent. Same result, no change in the, in the outcome, same result. I'm just taking advantage of the actual values, and I skip all these computations. Okay. Okay. The keyword is bit serial in terms of the hardware yeah, okay. design. And taking advantage of the fact that this is data parallel. Uh, so it's effectively microcode down there at the bottom, or are you laying out all of the hardware that you would need in the maximum case? Uh, we lay down, it's a trade-off, but you, if you want to have the worst case possible behavior to guarantee it, you can put the hardware down like that. And then use logic that you calculate on the fly to turn off some of them. I'm not turning off, I'm just... Uh, 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 I'm, uh, they finish early. It's a lot of units that are bit serial. Uh, I can take it offline. I can explain when we meet in person. But this is how this is how the magic happens in, uh, underneath. Uh, again, this does takes, takes advantage of your actual values at runtime. Nothing else. You don't have to do anything. If you can quantize your network in eight bits, it will still work. Right? It will give you the performance, uh, so on and so forth. This is the idea behind. It. And this is for computation right now. I want to go and talk about uh, how you can use this now for reducing memory. So remember, this is the computation. There are layers over there. And remember, the computation is this. I have uh, any given point of time, when you talk about hardware, hardware is finite. It's not infinite. So you want to process this whole volume uh, with Windows or whatever. At any given point of time, you're going to be processing only some values. So per cycle, because these circuits tend to be synchronous, every step, you're going to grab some values, example 16 from the activations, 16 from every filter, you're going to do the multiply and then accumulate on the corresponding output activations. I hope this kind of makes sense as a setup. Right? So any given point in time, I'm calculating with 16 values, right? Not with all the values. And furthermore, any given point in time, I have a specific input. Your network works for any image, right? However, at some point in time, you're processing 
one image and one image alone, right? That particular cycle. Good. Now, let's take that piece out. These are the input activations for illustration purposes. There are 16 values I care about at this moment, all right? So we put it up there. What is the expected distribution? I'm not going to pretend I know statistics, but I've, we looked at a lot of this stuff, and usually the distribution of these things tends to be this, or take this out if it's a ReLU. Right? So what happens is most of the values tend to cluster near zero. There are very few values in between a little bit, and, as you, and there are maybe somebody, uh, some at the end that kind of trigger. Right? And we've seen this for image classification networks all the time. We see like kind of like, and I, there's an intuition behind it, as far as I understand it, that you're looking for features, the features don't appear everywhere. So far so good? This is the expected distribution of values. Now, what does it mean? If you design your network to be 8-bit, what you're saying is, I don't care what my distribution is, I'm gonna use 8-bits for everybody. This is the equivalent, we have this room, all of you have an opinion, but there's one person that's yelling, right? And I make my decision based on that person. I say, oh, I need a lot of attention, right? And I don't refer to myself at this point. I'm just saying, somebody needs a lot of attention. Attention means a lot of bits. You pick the bits to accommodate that person. And by the way, you do this for all possible images that you may ever see in your life. In reality, however, that is just one person or a few of them, these guys up here. Furthermore, they may not occur for every single image. So the idea here is, can you design hardware that will reduce computation and memory communication when you try to accommodate for most people and have some exceptions for the other guys over here. So there are many ways you can do that. The simplest we found so far that works pretty well is this. We group things in the way they're going to be computed. So let's say I have 16 values. They're rotated like this. So this is least significant bit, most significant bit over here. And it's very simple in hardware runtime to say, look at all these guys. Who is the loudest one? This. So for this group and this group only, I'm going to execute on my hardware engine using just these bits. So I'm gonna adjust my precision on the fly based on your data. In, because of the statistics, most of the time, that bar is gonna be very low. Because the expectation is that most values are low. Only when you can get unlikely and you get some value that's kind of high in your group, then you use the full precision of your machine. This is for computation. In terms of communication, now again, when you store in memory, you do not have to store in whatever precision you, you pick, which is 8 bits, 16 bits. You just say, for this group, and there's a very nice, simple way to do that in hardware, use this many bits. Done. Long story short, if you look at the networks we've seen so far, for 16 bits, we reduce communication and memory storage and footprint to one third. And for 8 bits, we're very close to uh, about 40%. Just for that. Right? This is completely on the fly, nothing to do on your side. It just works like that. And there's also some indications for quantization, which I'll be happy to talk about if you work in that area. If you use uh, quantization, the, people that, the way people usually do, do it, they still fall into this uh, trap, which is the one size it fits all. I pick some size, eight bits. I quantize everything to eight bits, whether I need it or not. In most cases, in, or no, in some cases, you take a value space that requires a lot more bits and you squeeze it down to eight, which is what you really want to do with quantization. In other cases, there's a value space that's tiny. You need two, three bits. But because you do quantization, it's usually linear or whatever, they take and they expand so the quantization. A run length encoding where you, as you read in the bits, you figure out what values they apply to? Uh, when I read this group to compute on it, mm -hmm. this is really just a neural network that looks at what is the most significant bit that is one. And I say to the hardware, this is the precision you need when it's coming in. When I compute something to write down to memory, I do the same and I say, oh, I have this group of values I'm gonna write to memory. Because when you write to memory, if you work with ZPUs, you know they like to write things in bulk as opposed to one value, you write a block of 128 bytes or whatever it is in, in modern ZPUs. You scan these values in hardware and scan is very simple, it's just an O tree. You find the most significant bit that is one and you say for this group, you're gonna use this precision. And we have a nice simple encoding how we ship those things to memory. It's not run length encoding, it's basically you say these values are five bits, these values are eight bits. There's no run length or anything like that. But the property, I mean, I would like to view our work as two steps. First, there are properties, and then there are ways to exploit them. So the first thing is, oh look, the values tend to have these statistics. Second part is, how can I practically exploit it? And I, there's other stuff you can potentially do. We just have so many resources and we've only done this so far. So this is goes after communication. So let's keep this kind of thing. So just to give you a hint, uh, a sense of what's going on, 
This is Google Net. This results of with 16-bit Google Net. Mind you, you can uh, quantize uh, Google, uh, Google Net to 8 bits, no problem. And I don't have the results to show you today. For, I do have another slide, but I don't think we're going to have enough time to go and explain it. But I want you to look at that. This is the effective precision in bits we get per layer. So notice there's, there's a lot of numbers here, and this is a wonderful slide you should never show to anybody, but there's a point I'm trying to make. Look at these values. First of all, they're fractional. Uh, computer hardware is not fractional. You're using some number of bits. However, we choose the number of bits per group. In this case, it's two, uh, if I remember correctly, it's like 256. So for every 256 values as we process them, we say use this many bits. We, are, we will summarize everything, add them up, and then say how many groups are there. This is the average precision I, I get. So notice the numbers are fractional, 533, which means there are some that were 8, some that were 3, some were 2. It follows the distribution. And then you get a fractional part. The other part I want to point out is the number is not 8. Okay? It's, it's never 8. There are numbers that you say, come on, it's okay, you average you get 8, right? So quantization can do that. But there are other cases where the number is not 8, right? So this is, for example, very close to 5. And we don't do any retraining. I mean, here you see it's below 4. So there is stuff in the application that you can take advantage on your, with, at the hardware level. And we didn't try to retrain the network to recover anything. This is plain as it is. This is the slide I won't be able to show, but it kind of shows that the same phenomenon applies if you do a quantization that is value aware. Uh, let's see how much time we have. Maybe I can just point a little bit on this and then I'll stop, I think. Uh, as I was saying before, I'm an academic, so if you give me your whole day, which you shouldn't, mm -hmm. I can talk until the midnight, but maybe we shouldn't do that. Uh, so we start with this. Somebody said you should compute on that. Okay. Wonderful. But we're trying to be clever. We know that in some cases, some of the weights are going to be zero. Padding, or naturally, some of the weights are zero. And there is techniques, and I think the term that's being used for that is pruning, where you force some weights to be zero. Right, the, those connections are not necessarily needed. So they're zero, and we want to keep skip of those. That's called sparsity. That's what the term that people use. So we want to take away that computation. Not only that, however, we want to advance in time some other computations in, 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 in time. So this actually takes less time. This is just weight sparsity. There is also a lot of activations that happen to zero naturally. And this is nearly like 40 to 50% for convolutional neural networks and others too, near zero or zero. And I want to get rid of those. Looks simple, right? I don't know if you try this on a GPU, it's very hard to do because of the structure of the hardware now. And I will explain what's the problem. The problem is this. This is a mock-up diagram that uh, will, uh, I will try to use to understand, so that I can communicate what is the fundamental problem when you try to exploit har at the hardware level sparsity. This is a dense network. That is, all the values are non-zero. This is the weight that are coming in from somewhere, memory. And I'm doing some of them in parallel because I want to do that in how to take performance. That's what GPUs do. They do a lot of cal calculations in parallel. These are activations. And they're all non-zero. If all your values are non-zero, you know that every product matters. And because you know everything in advance, you can put things in memory and schedule them in time so that at the right cycle, the right pair of weight and activation appears at the right multiplier and accumulator. This is very easy to do. And there's tons of stuff how to schedule or stuff like this, but because you have to calculate everything, this is very nice, very easy to do in advance, no problem with this. This is dense networks. Once you sparsify, so there are some weights that are zeros, the gray ones, there are some activations that are zero. Here's the problem. You would like, for example, in the space of this to advance this guy here. That is movement in time. Okay. So somehow you need to move this as you read it from memory. Instead of reading this guy, you've got to read this. And that's not easy because memory doesn't like small reads. Memory likes big reads, wide ones. Uh, you may also want to take this guy and move it here, which is motion both in time and space. So you took something that was to appear here, and now you moved it here so it has to appear on this multiplier to fill up them up all, but also in time too. So this is from the weight side. Weight, there is some chance of doing that because you know them in advance. Right? The problem is also worse for activations. You don't know in advance what's zero. You got to read the value. You, see to, you have to see that it's zero, and then you have to read another value and move it here. So for example, in this case, I will have to take this activation, move it here in time and space, and then go find the right weight from the other side and move that too. So, and you got to do this in hardware. 
How do people solve this so far? So I have a very nice diagram, so I'm going to skip, which is kind of supposedly illustrates that. There's a very nice design, Cambricon, it's actually a company now, where they try to do, uh, no, they actually do take advantage of sparsity, and however, only on the weight side. They pack things as tightly as possible in memory, so they provide maximum flexibility here. <coughs> so you can, move, you can do arbitrary, almost nearly arbitrary motions in space and time for the weights. They don't do anything for the activations. Once you move something here, then you have to do what's called an associative search on the activation side to try to find, oh, I moved here. I used to be somewhere else. Let me try to find that activation from there and bring it. So that's expensive, very expensive, and only gives you the weight side. Uh, if, if you're really interested in hardware, there's a very, very nice piece of work from NVIDIA, SCNN, which takes advantage of the natural properties of uh, convolutional neural networks and does this very nicely. They pack both weights and activations as tightly as possible in memory. And then they have essentially a big cross part at the output. These are very expensive things. And they try to write to big accumulator banks. And again, I understand I'm not describing this in very detail, in sufficient detail, actually. But I, what I want you to get, to get out of this is that the common theme in both approaches is maximum flexibility, and then you pay at it at the hardware. There's a lot of hardware overhead at runtime to do this kind of thing. So I, when I was uh, 15, I decided I have to be cool. So I wanted to learn guitar. Uh, and I pick up a guitar. And within one month, I knew four chords. So I could play maybe 90% of the pop songs of the time, right? That's the, the thing. Uh, if I wanted, so what's the effort? It was about here. And I, no, no, maybe, and maybe, in my case, maybe it was here. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, what I, if I want to be a virtuoso in guitar, I will probably have to spend the rest of my life, and I will never be. So I decided not to do that. No, I don't even remember the chords anymore. Long story short, with many things in life, there's an effort you have to, 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 to pay, to put in, and there's a reward. And especially if you do a degree, a PhD, you have to decide the problem you're working on, which part of the, is the state of the art? Is it down here or is it up there? If it's up there, I don't know if you should be working on that. Long story short, here in our case, for sparsity, the designs that exist, they say, I'm going to put a lot of effort to give you the maximum reward. I'm going to allow you to move things in time and space as much as possible so I can get you as much of that. You with me on this? There's another design point. This is, this is what other works does. There's another design point, and this is our design, the one we're targeting. We say, you know what? I'm not going to allow you to remove every single zero. I'm just going to allow you to remove enough of them. Right. Why? Because this is going to simplify the hardware. I'm going to get pretty much the same performance. And at the end, because I simplify the hardware, actually, I'm going to be much better, even with performance as well. So the idea behind tactical is to try to remove enough zeros, but do it cleverly so you pay a lot less in hardware overhead, and at the end, you're much better. And this is the key ingredients. The first part is to remove zero uh, weights. We do that in software. That is, we allow restricted motion of weights. You cannot just move arbitrary any weight to any position in time and space. We allow a specific pattern. And uh, this is who is here, and Dylan and another student from my group have developed a very nice scheduling algorithm that does uh, best allocation of weights to movements possible. So it's a scheduling algorithm where we map things. So when you get them from memory, they're already scheduled, and they say, I used to be there, and I moved here but only limited motion. And the other key ingredient of, uh, of uh, tactical is the second part. Remember, the other designs, SNN in particular, tries to remove zero activations. And this is very hard and very expensive in hardware because this is a dynamically sparse pattern. You don't know what it is. You discover it as you're fetching things. So we're saying, look, if you target zero activation weight, uh, zero activations, you have to contend with the fact that is, uh, this is a dynamically sparse pattern. Furthermore, for the stuff we see, at best you're looking at 50% of them being zero. Often enough, it's less than that. So at most, you're going to get 2x out of this. However, here's another thing you can do. Instead of doing this, what you can say, look, look at the values of the activations. All of them, not only the non-zero ones, all of them. Look at the zero bits. 90 plus percent of them is zero. So instead of targeting just those values that are zero as a whole, we say target all values. And instead of targeting zeros as a whole, target the zero bits for every single value. Targeting zero values gives you 50%. Targeting zero bits gives you 90%. Why? Because it targets both classes, both the zeros and the non-zeros too. What is the big thing about hardware? No motion. You're, proce you're processing all activations. You're not trying to remove anything. 
You take the activation, you say, I'm going to process only these bits. So you cannot define away the problem of trying to move things in, in time and space for the activations. There's no motion of activations in time and space, only from the weights. So this is, uh, this is tactical. Anyway, I think I've uh, overextended uh, the use of your time. Uh, there's a lot of other activity in our group. Uh, I had some data to show you. Our, our prime jewel in terms of, uh, of uh, removing computation and doing things as fast as possible is the one where you take this uh, multiplication. And we have architectures that do this. They squeeze the activation as much as possible. Then we have uh, engines that remove the zero bits as well. And finally, we have another design, which is uh, pretty cool if you ask me, because it doesn't have multipliers. It has a histogram engine inside. It kind of looks a little bit like a statistical engine to, to do this kind of thing. And to do this multiplication, it will do just these computations. So, and we get tremendous reduction in computation and data movement out of this. Uh, I understand that uh, we're here to serve. Sorry for using that term, that's, that's what it is. Hardware is just a tool. Mm, the, what I really like to do is actually try to build machines that are faster, better, the only way this can be done moving forward is if you actually get the attention of people who do applications. I was lucky enough to be in U of T. I was lucky enough to, have, to see what was happening with machine learning. Right? I was teaching courses that some of the people have taken and they managed to do wonderful things out of uh, the hardware that existed at the time as well. And uh, my interest is, is in reaching out to people that do applications. And machine learning was always on, on the, you know, for the past five years was always the target. I am lucky enough that I have some of the attention within the Cochisa network, but I'd be very grateful if any of you are interested in working with us. How can we be useful to you? You have an application and you want to get better performance on the commodity hardware that exists out there. I have an interest in helping you with that. Why? Because I get access to your application. That's why. Right? Uh, uh, second thing is I want to study your application to see if there is any, uh, any decisions that this, uh, any uh, behavior that I can exploit so I can build better hardware for you. Better hardware may be tomorrow through the configurable hardware. Tomorrow, read a couple of months, by the way. Or it could be actual physical hardware that we can build with some company or some partner that will do, uh, would, uh, you can have access in a couple of years. And as a skeleton, remember, there is the NSA Cohesa network, which is primarily hardware people. There is some software people as part of that. There is a lot of interest in talking to people like you. And I hope we can have a bit more time as we move forward. Right, so Thank you for your time today. I think that's enough of, of this. Thank you. <laughs>